We turn to this part of God's Word, 1 Thessalonians 5, uh, verses 1 to 11 this evening, and thinking together of preparing for Jesus' second coming. And all of us have faced big days in our lives. Some of those big days were joyful occasions, such as our wedding day or our graduation day, but other big days were terrifying, such as the day of our transfer test. Isn't that right, boys and girls? Uh, or the day of our court appearance, uh, speaking theoretically, of course. But whether the day was big because of a good event or a bad event, we approached it with reserve, some fear of how we would get through that day. To mitigate that fear, to reduce those nerves, to stop the shaking, we focused on preparing for the big event. We sought to have as much ready as possible before that big day arrived. We learned our times tables. We talked to our barrister. We ordered our graduation gown. And it's this idea of preparing for a big event that we have in verses 1 to 11. The biggest of big days is coming to us. Described in verse 2 as the day of the Lord. The phrase refers throughout Scripture and certainly in this place to the second coming of Jesus. To judge unbelievers. and To bring believers into everlasting glory. These two aspects of the day of the Lord are mentioned in verse 9. Wrath and salvation. We call this day the Lord's Day. That is a day connected to the Lord Jesus and devoted to our Lord Jesus. And all that we do on this day, we try to connect it to him and devote it to him. But many people in our world do not observe the Lord's Day. To them, it's just like every other day of the week. No church for them. No private worship for them. No cessation of work for them. But the biggest of big days, the day of the Lord will undoubtedly and unavoidably be the Lord's day. John says in Revelation 1-7, every eye will see him. Jesus will be the sole focus of attention as he descends from heaven gloriously, physically, spectacularly, loudly, majestically. Every office worker in the cities will leave their desks and congregate in the streets to see him. Every farmer will get out of their tractor and look at him. Every little girl will put down their doll and study the glorious figure of Jesus. Every little boy will set aside his football and look at Jesus. The day of the Lord. The believers in Thessalonica were well informed about this day. Verse 2. You yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come. But that knowledge, that full awareness of Jesus' return was making them nervous, I think. They were asking themselves, how will we fare on that day? This is a very different concern than the one we thought of last Sabbath evening at the end of chapter 4. The concern there was about those who might not be involved in that glorious day. But the concern here is about those who will be involved in that glorious day. What about them? How will they manage Perhaps you ask that question in your darker moments, in your weaker times. 
The apostle, I think, in this passage is responding to this underlying fear in this paragraph about this glorious, majestic, final day of our world and universe, the day of the Lord. And he addresses their concern in two ways. Firstly, a minimalistic way, he assures them of their salvation. He says to them, do not worry. Do not fear. You belong to Christ. You are covered in his righteousness. You are safe. See verse 4 and 5. You are not in darkness. You are all children of the light. Children of the day. And again in verse 8, he gives this assurance. We belong to the day having believed the gospel, they are not to be uncertain of their final salvation. They are safe. But secondly, rather than being paralyzed with fear and doubt or uncertainty about their future, the apostle argues that they are to prepare for that biggest of big days, by living fully for Jesus. And it's this aspect of preparing for the return of Jesus that we emphasize this evening, which is emphasized in this paragraph. The apostle identifies four ways as we move through these 11 verses of preparing for Jesus' second coming. Firstly, in verses 1 to 8a, the apostle emphasizes that we are sober, and we'll think about what this means. So in verse number 6, read it with me again. He says, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. As the apostle thinks of this coming of Jesus again, he exhorts us to be sober. Again in verse 8, he uses the same exhortation, but since we belong to the day, let us be sober. Here is a way for us to prepare for the second coming of Jesus. Now, metaphors are multiple in this Opening section, verses 1 to 8a. So I'll try and steer you through uh, the apostles' thinking here. The metaphor used by, the big metaphor used by the apostle in these verses is from the, the daily cycle of light and darkness, day and night. Paul uses two colors of our day to distinguish between those who are ready for the return of Jesus and those who are not. The colors of light and of darkness. And in doing this, he develops the idea of day, which he has mentioned. He's talking about the day of the Lord. And so he continues with that idea of day, and he analyzes it. Well, a day has a period of light, and a day has a period of darkness. And he develops this idea of the light and of the darkness. There's some who are in the light, and there's others who are in the darkness. And interpreting these two colors of day and night, of light and dark, the apostle interprets dark as representing sinful actions and a lack of understanding. Sinful actions and a lack of understanding. He interprets light as representing godly actions and spiritual understanding. And we're familiar with this correlation between colors and spiritual teaching, aren't we? Many of us have been taught at some point in our life the wordless book. And the wordless book uses colors to give spiritual teaching the golden page for heaven, the white for forgiveness the black for sin. 
And the apostle is doing this here. There's the darkness for a lack of understanding and sinful action. There's the light for godly action and spiritual understanding. Think about what he says about the darkness, uh, first of all. Darkness, night, represents sinful actions, unbelief, transgression, blindness of heart. But alongside that spiritual understanding of darkness, the apostle compounds this this imagery and metaphor by the, the literal understanding of darkness. He argues that many sins are committed in the dark. We talk with shock about a crime being committed in broad daylight. And so he says in verse 7 of chapter 5, those who get drunk are drunk in the night. And so not only does he talk about the the metaphor of darkness and of night, he's also referring to the, the literal night. John Chrysostom, in his commentary, adds tomb raiding and immorality to the sin of drunkenness as sins committed in the night in his world. So dark behavior, sinful behavior characterizes those in the night, but also blindness, a lack of understanding. Verse 3 says, while people are saying peace, and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them. Here are the people of the night. And in the night, they not only engage in sinful behavior, but also their understanding is blind and dark. They're not aware that Jesus is coming again in power and glory and majesty. They have wealth. They have health. They have success. They lack for nothing, but they have no thought of God, no fear of meeting him, no care for their soul. They are in darkness. They are blind in their understanding, ignorant of the danger that they are in. And the apostle links this false sense of security to darkness in verse 4. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you. So being surprised by Jesus' second coming is linked to the people who are in the night, who are in darkness, who have lack of spiritual understanding. To emphasize his point here and to to give us some some light, some some help on this complex matter that the apostle is looking at here, he uses two well-known illustrations of something coming suddenly upon us the labor pains for women or the thief to a house both experiences unannounced without warning so the return of Jesus will come to those in the darkness suddenly unexpectedly but in contrast to that there are those in the light. In contrast to those who are sleeping, to those who are engaged in in, in wrong behavior, to those who are lacking spiritual understanding, are those who are in the light. And those who are in the light have an understanding of the return of Jesus. Verse 1, he says, now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware. Here are people in the light. It is probably true that within their Reformed tradition, there's not enough preaching on the second coming of Jesus. We're afraid, aren't we, Tim, of interpreting Revelation wrongly? The seven bowls, the seven seals, the seven trumpets are engaging in speculation about the second coming. But despite that, we know he's coming. We are in the light. And the behavior of those in the light is described as being sober. This is coming to our point now. Verse 6, let us keep awake 
and be sober. Verse 8, since we belong to the day, let us be sober. We're not in the night with the spiritual darkness and the wicked behavior. We're in the light. And in the light, knowing that Jesus is coming again, how does that impact us? What do we do? How do we live? He says, since we belong to the day, let us be sober. Sober does include the narrow meaning of not being drunk. Drunkenness may have been a common sin in Thessalonica, and so it's specifically mentioned here in these verses. But this command also includes the more general meaning of being self-controlled. The drunk person is not in control of herself, but we are to be sober. We are to be in control of ourself, of our thoughts, of our words, of our actions as the servants of Christ. And as we think of Jesus coming again and of us standing before him and of us seeing him in his glory and being with him forever, we want to live in the light. We want to be sober. We want to be controlling our lives so that we will please him. And look forward to him, not with masses of guilt, but with joy and anticipation. Linger over the mention of drunkenness. The, the apostle picks out here, this is the one sin that he mentions in these eight verses. And we should be clear, young people and older people too, that drunkenness is a sin. It's not a weakness. It's not a bad habit. It's a sin. And in my ministry, I have had more cases of professing Christians who were older people struggling with alcohol addiction and drunkenness than with young people getting drunk. This action belongs to the children of darkness and to the works of darkness. Drunkenness is included in numerous lists of sins in the New Testament. Local banger girl, Sarah Martin, has been describing her struggle with alcohol on the BBC Northern Ireland website over this weekend. Her addiction began drinking socially with her peers and nights out in Belfast, but progressed. She blames a low sense of self-esteem. She describes in detail the blackouts that she had, not remembering whole nights out with her, with her friends. Robs us of our self-control. This people of the light. People expecting that glorious return of Jesus, our Savior. We are to be sober, self-controlled, waiting for him. Because we have work to do. Service to render. People to evangelize. Children to raise. Backsliders to restore. Church members to encourage. We need to be sober. Firstly, let us be sober. Secondly, let us dress up. This is verse 8b uh, of our reading here. Let us put on, or, or having put on, the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. And here is the, the second command that the apostle highlights uh, as he discusses here the coming day of the Lord. As these believers anticipate it, he encourages them uh, with this statement in verse 8b. The metaphor used here is from the Roman soldier. The soldier is linked to the previous point, probably of being sober as an example of someone who is sober, who is awake, ready to respond to any impending danger. The two pieces of protective armor which a Roman soldier wore are mentioned here in verse 8, a helmet and a breastplate. Both were made of leather, chain mail, or metal, and covered the vital parts of the body. The soldier didn't wear his body armor when he kicked football in the back garden with his kids, 
or cleaned out the gutters of his house or played chess with his neighbor in the front room. But he wore it when he went to battle. That's the point being made here. As we prepare for Jesus' second coming, we're engaged in a spiritual conflict. We're to take these pieces of armor, faith, hope, and love. Faith in Jesus alone for salvation. Love to the church and all people. And hope of the second coming of our Lord. These three graces which define a Christian as chapter 1 indicates. Help us prepare for the second coming of Jesus. They differ from the, the armor God put on in Isaiah 59. He is going into battle with his breastplate and his helmet, which the prophet depicts there. But we are in a, in a different role. And we put on the breastplate of faith and love on our heart and hope in our minds. Graces which influence our thoughts and our emotions and our fears. By this metaphor, the apostle is seeking to calm the fears of his readers. He says, you have put on the breastplate of faith and hope and love. He's assuring them that they are ready for that great day. Some depictions of the day of the Lord in the Old Testament prophets is deeply scary. And as these new believers interacted with that spirit-enlightened understanding with those Old Testament depictions of the day of the Lord, they could have been scared. He's exhorting them and encouraging them. The chief graces of Christianity are seen in you. You have put on faith and hope and love. But he's reminding them that they're in a spiritual conflict as they await Jesus' return. The rest, the final victory, is not now, but when he comes. We're soldiers in this world, called to fight for our Lord and to serve him in this world. Our great enemies are the world and the flesh and the devil. But how do we fight our bad temper, our covetousness, our pride. With the defensive armor of faith and hope and love. The breastplate of faith in Jesus will prevent greed entering our heart because all our riches are in Jesus. The breastplate of love will prevent envy and jealousy entering our heart when we hear of another's success. Hope will prevent pride getting into our head by remembering Jesus as the great and coming one. Put on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of salvation. Gavin Ortland has written a fascinating book on humility. He's the brother of Dane Ortland, the author of Gentle and Lowly. And in this book on humility, uh, Gavin Ortland opens up his own experience. Uh, he, he said that he began to hear of the success, the far greater success of his brother's book, Gentle and Lowly, selling by the millions. And his had a trickle of sales, but, although it's a good book. And early on he said, I, I made this determination that every time I heard of the success of my brother's book, I would pray that it would be even more successful. He put on the breastplate of love, which prevented the arrow of envy entering his heart. As we prepare for Jesus coming again, we're to have on the breastplate of love for the brothers and sisters and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ alone and this hope of salvation guarding our minds and hearts that we won't get entangled with the matters of this life and, and consumed with the here and now. But this hope of salvation will keep our minds rightly focused 
from all those arrows of temptation which are leveled against us. Thirdly, let us look up. We're moving on to verse 9 and 10. And here the apostle breaks in now, moving away from these practical commands of sober up and dress up into this doctrinal statement in verses 9 and 10. And and, and we're amazed incredibly how often he interjects doctrine into very practical pieces. And, And read with me these verses, 9 and 10. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or sleep, are asleep, we might live with him. The focus changes from what we do to what God has done for us in Jesus. And this is the key preparation for Judgment Day, the redemptive work of God in Jesus. He has died for us. He has paid the price that our sins deserve so that we might be forgiven and made ready to meet God beyond the works of light, beyond the armor of faith, hope, and love. is the gracious work of God and Jesus for us. So we are to look up, to look away from ourselves to the grace of God and Jesus. And two aspects of his gracious works are mentioned here, election and atonement. Election in verse 9, by God the Father, God has destined us to obtain salvation in eternity, in his sovereignty, with nothing connected to our faith or repentance or good works, he has destined us. And they did not need to be afraid of the return of Jesus because God in heaven had destined them for salvation. Paul has already described how he was sure of this in chapter 1 verse 4, knowing that they had believed the gospel that he had proclaimed to them. The atonement of Jesus is that other gracious work in verse 10, who died for us. What makes the thought of the final judgment scary for us is our sins. But we look up to Jesus and remember that he has died for us. He has suffered the wrath of God, which we deserve. So whether alive or dead, when Jesus comes again, awake or asleep, we will be with him. Boys and girls, I used to go along to a, a mechanic, a great mechanic, very kind mechanic, and it, he, he, would, he would give us the bill at some point afterwards. And on one occasion, I had this bill to pay him, a, a substantial bill. And I went three times to his garage, and he wasn't there. I, and it was awkward. I tried to avoid him in the street. I had this bill that I needed to pay him and, and tried to pay him, but, but I couldn't get, get round to paying him because we, we didn't meet up at the same time. What calms us as we anticipate this biggest of big days is what God has done for us in his grace. Our debt is paid. And we look forward to being in the presence of Jesus forever. We get assurance of salvation sometimes and in some way from evidences of God's work in our hearts. Paul refers to these in the Thessalonians. But the chief ground of our confidence is not in our works. They are flawed and frail. But here in verses 9 and 10, the gracious work of God towards us. And lastly, as we anticipate Jesus' second coming, let us build up verse 11. This is how he finishes Uh, This paragraph, therefore encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Coming at the end of this contemplation of the day of the Lord is the command for us to build each other up. It's a construction metaphor as you could imagine. The foundation of our Christian lives has been laid in Jesus' work, but now the building 
the shaping of the house of our life, our character, is happening. And the building of a house here is not only our responsibility, but the responsibility of one another. We're to desire a strong, stable, well-built house for ourselves and for our fellow believers. We're to look at our own lives and the lives of other church members and build one another up. But how can we make, help to make the character of our fellow believers strong? Some of us are convinced that's by pointing out the mistakes of our fellow believers, maybe not verbally to them, but inwardly or in private, you're constantly disappointed with them. You notice their multiple earrings, dyed hair, t-shirt and trainers at church, but you do not notice them. You're superficial in your consideration of others. You're negative. But look at the way mentioned in this verse. To build each other up is by encouraging one another. We can do this by our example. There's a brother who's a voracious reader of novels. We can shun him or we can pass him a good book. There's a sister who's an avid cinema goer. We can despise her or we can invite her to your plus. We can encourage by our words a young person successful in their exams. We can congratulate them. Someone who has failed their driving test, we can suggest you'll pass it the next time. Have you encouraged Diane in her intern role yet? Have you commended the ladies from our congregation who cooked at the summer camp? Have you commended the leaders of the Holiday Bible Club in their role and those who led the church weekend for their work? False praise is no praise, but no praise, no encouragement is unbiblical behavior. Encourage one another and thereby build one another up. Let's be absolutely sure of this, that your encouragement will be effective. Because in most of our lives, for every one encouragement that we receive, we receive ten discouragements. So your encouragement is crucial. If you have a criticism, and there is a place for criticism to make, put it in the sandwich of two encouragements. We all get enough criticism from unbelievers. Let's not be overcritical among us here. It's ironic, isn't it? We think our criticism will help the person, build the person up, make them the man they should be, the woman they should be, but the reality is that it could destroy the person. It's not Criticism that builds one another up, verse 11 says, but encouragement. It's true in our homes, isn't it? Children thrive on encouragement. They crumble on harsh, relentless criticism. The commentator on the Irish rugby game mentioned last night, and we're all watching it, weren't we? Okay, maybe apart from Trevor, we still get back from Yuri. But anyway, thanks for that, Trevor. Okay, the commentator on the, the, the match last night, in a moment where, where Ireland made a mistake <coughs> and gave away a, 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 a throw in, whatever it is, the, the line, the line, the line. <laughs> yeah, rugby. No, it's not great. Okay, that thing near their own, near their own try line. The commentator said, 15 years ago, Johnny Sexton would have been screaming at his team. But last night, he was going around clapping them on the back, encouraging them to give all in defending that line in. As we wait for Jesus 
second coming. Let us encourage one another and so build one another up just as you're doing. Let's all take a time to look over the list of members and linger in every name and ask ourselves of each one, how am I building him up? How am I building her up? As we wait for Jesus to come. So what are you preparing for today? Our home, we're preparing for a couple of birthdays this week. But far greater than these events is the return of Jesus. And we are to think of it and prepare for it by sobering up, by dressing up, by looking up, and by building one another up.